to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your host for Commission Ed. So, Reed, today's episode is another toolbox, one that we have promised that we needed to get out to the audience this time on the topic of mentorship. And I think that this is a great follow on to the episode that we just released last week, the interview with Lieutenant Colonel Tim Scheffler about being a civil engineer and how he was such a great mentor, is such a great mentor to me. And this episode, this toolbox on mentorship actually came as a result of an invitation for us to join a meeting of the Society of American Military Engineers or SAME, S-A-M-E, that happened a couple months ago. Captain Matthew Scrivener, who actually happens to be an army officer, invited us to join this meeting and share some of our thoughts on mentorship. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I was uncertain what to encounter, right? You know, right. this is a gathering of military engineers. You know, I wasn't quite sure how it was going to go, but I really enjoyed the session. And I think there's some nuggets here and I'm looking forward to bringing it to the audience today. Yeah, for sure. Like you, I wasn't sure exactly what to expect. You know, I am a civil engineer. I've been to SAMI meetings, but I'm also in the process of cross-training out of civil engineering, right? The audience is fully aware now of my reasons for doing that. And I shared my apprehension with the group there. You'll hear it in the episode that there were reasons why I am leaving the civil engineering career field and mentorship was part of that, right? Yeah. And so we weren't exactly sure what to expect from our attendance at that meeting, but it actually turned out to be really, really good to the point where we asked Captain Scrivener for permission to share the episode. He was very gracious, provided us the audio. And like you said earlier, really excited to bring this episode to the audience. One thing we need to say, though, is that this is going to be a, a little bit different format than what you might expect. Right, Reed? Yeah. So in order to kind of tidy it up a little bit, again, we were at a meeting. It was live. It was a Zoom session with people all over the United Kingdom. We're just going to tidy it up a little bit. So instead of allowing the audio to just flow and, you know, give the audience the entire meeting, you and I are going to read essentially the questions that we were asked, and then we'll kind of cut in our responses. It just tidies it up a little bit and make it a little bit more digestible for a podcast. Exactly. Yeah, that's the point. And that's what people should expect from this. It is a toolbox episode, so don't expect, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, interview, conversation, that kind of thing. And the idea being you can dive in, get something that you need, dive back out again and go apply it somewhere. Okay. Yeah. So after this long introduction, now let's dive into the conversation we had about mentorship with the Society of American Military Engineers in the United Kingdom. We're excited to talk to you today about mentorship. You know, it's a super important topic. None of us would be here without some mentors at some stages or many mentors at different stages. And so we're excited to, you know, take your questions. We've got some things prepared, but we're, we're looking forward to discussing this important topic with you today. So the first question that we were posed and that we're going to start the conversation off with today is why is it important to find a mentor? Yeah, this is a great question and really sets the stage for really how the rest of this conversation can go. First of all, let's define mentorship. Mentorship is a relationship between a mentor and a mentee. Typically, that's going to be someone of higher rank or greater experience providing information and advice to someone of a lower rank, less experience. It doesn't always have to be like that. It can be peer-to-peer. -peer. For example, read. I count you as one of my mentors, for sure. Somebody that I can go to to help me understand the situation and fill in the gaps you know, and address my 
blind spots. So that then gets into why is it important to find a mentor? Because you can't see everything. You don't know everything. And if you want to be successful in your career as an Air Force officer, as an engineer, or just you know in anything that you end up pursuing, you need to decide early on what success is going to look like for you as an individual. Now, you can use the definition of success that the Air Force provides, or it doesn't even have to be the Air Force. Like, for example, Matt, you're in the Army. The Army has its own definition of success. If you're in the business world, the private business world has its own definitions of success. But we think that it's important that you personally define success for yourself and do that early on so that you can start to pursue it. But the thing is that the earlier on that you decide what that success looks like, the less context and the less knowledge that you are going to have about how to achieve that type of success. So that there is where a mentor is going to enter in to provide that context, to provide that knowledge of the unwritten and the written rules that will enable or prevent that success from happening. Reed, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I think you hit it on the head. And I think it's important that we highlight the relationship aspect. A role model and a mentor are very different things. Role model relationship may not even require that that person knows you exist. That may just be some, you know, it could even be a celebrity. It could be someone that you've heard or someone that you see from a distance. There's no relationship involved. That's a really key difference that makes a role model different from a mentor. And that relationship is what really matters. And why we say it's important. My dad said something to me growing up that has always stuck with me. He said, there's two ways to learn something, either by your own experience or the experience of others. And sometimes you have to have an experience for you to really understand and to learn something. And other times you really don't want to have the experience in order to learn something. And a mentor can help you know where you need to be on that spectrum. They can help you struggle sometimes. They can allow you to experience something so that you can learn something that you need. Or they can, hey, take my advice. You don't want to go down that path. And that's something that is really valuable. And Colin, I'm glad you brought up identifying what success looks like. You also need to identify the roles. And I'm sure we'll talk about that. I have many, many mentors for many different things. I know we're focused on professional and that's fine. But whatever you see in your life and you see in others and you think there's a gap there that you would like to close, I think that's something you could think about seeking out a mentor in. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't have to be professional. It can be any number of aspects of your life. The important thing is that you see something in somebody else that you want and then you pursue that now that person who has what you want might be a good mentor for that they might not be they might be terrible but the fact is that you have identified ahead of time what it is that you're trying to achieve and then you're going to actively pursue it with the help of another person so that is the mentorship relationship and we welcome additional questions on it so the next question, not so much of a question, but more of a discussion point was brought up that a mentor may not have exactly the trait or the achievement that you are looking for, but that they will have some life experience that will be valuable to you. And here's our response to that. Many of the lessons that we learn come from the conversations, the act of talking something out. And that's actually one of the things that identify someone as a good mentor is that they provide you the guide rails for you to solve your own problem. They don't just bequeath all of their knowledge onto you and then let you do with it as you will, but rather they facilitate your own learning. That is the best kind of mentor. Good discussion there. Uh, the next question that we talked about is how to distinguish a good mentor from a bad one. And I think there's some interesting points in here. So this is how you can distinguish what a good mentor is. So some other things that you might want to take into consideration as you are identifying a good mentor from a bad one. Can you have that connection with them? Can you have a relationship with them? 
is it somebody that you're actually able to converse with? You know, for example, what Reed was saying earlier about, you know, the difference between a mentor and a role model. You may think that the chief of staff of the Air Force would be a great mentor for you. And they probably would be, you know, General Brown, I'm sure is an amazing mentor. But what's your access to him? Very limited. What's his availability? Very limited. So you want to make sure that a mentor is going to be someone that you can actually have a conversation with, that you have access to, that is going to be available to you. Not saying that they have to be available every single day or at your beck and call, but if you can't connect with them, if you can't have that relationship, then they're not going to be a good mentor for you. So, Colin, I think you had some good points there. There are basic logistics that make someone a good versus a bad mentor. Something else I think I would like to give everybody a little bit of a warning on as it's super important to have mentors and it's super important to connect with someone is just be wary of the motivations of someone when they want to mentor you. And why do I say that? I have been almost recruited as a mentee and I could tell that the person was out in order to get some things for themselves. And it was a really weird situation. And I'm not saying that every time someone, you know, brings you under their wing that they're trying to, you know, create the next them or they have some ulterior motive. But just that's one of the things I think it would be important for you to understand what makes a good mentor. Everyone wants to learn. Everyone wants to think that they are worthy of being guided and directed. And so I think especially younger officers, you know, I envision you know, like little baby birds in a nest, you know, just like feed me, right? They just, they want all the knowledge that they can get. And sometimes there are unscrupulous people out there who are like, okay, I'm going to take you and I'm going to guide you. Uh, Just try to get to the heart of their motivations. It only happened once, but it was enough for me to kind of put my guard up when people always want to give me advice. And so I think that's something to think about is like, are they guiding you to help you Or are they guiding you so that they can get something? I think that's something I would like to caution folks. I know that's kind of a weird thing, but I had a pretty, pretty interesting experience that kind of gave me that wariness, if you will. It's a good point, Reed. And just to add on to it, but from a slightly different perspective or direction, it might not be that they want to get something out of you or to benefit themselves, but it might be that they don't know how to mentor you to help you, but they only know how to mentor you to become more like them. And remember, the point of mentorship is to help the mentee, not the mentor. The mentor's already made it. That's how they are a mentor, is that they've already found success in a particular area. So if they are then unable to help the mentee to achieve their goals, their definition of success, then that is not a good relationship. And that was actually my experience as a civil engineer, that I had great, great commanders, really fantastic engineers who were trying to mentor me to become like them. And that's not what I wanted. And that's actually one of the reasons what drove me off active duty the first time is that there was a disconnect between what my commanders, what my quote mentors at the time were trying to get me to do versus what I wanted for myself and my Air Force career. And so I left active duty. And to be frank, it's one of the reasons why I'm leaving civil engineering. It's not that there's anything wrong with civil engineering, for sure. It's a fantastic career field. Love the stuff that I was able to do and see people that I got to work with. But I personally, found that my definition of success didn't align with what they were trying to get me to do within civil engineering. Still want to be an Air Force officer, but feel like I need to go a different direction in order to achieve my personal definition of success. All right, Reed, so we now know what to look for in a mentor. The next question is, how do I find a mentor? Where do I go? Who should I talk to? What sort of things should I do in order to find someone to be my mentor. I think you kind of hinted at it earlier, Colin, but as I kind of discussed previously as well, you can find a mentor in almost any role, any position, 
any hat that you wear. The thing is, they need to have something that you either want to achieve or they have reached some plateau or some place that you want to go. That's the first step. That's how you identify. And then when you see someone, you know, let's say father, right? Let's say that you're a new father or a new wife or a new spouse, and you see someone with a relationship that's 20, 30 years down the road from where you are, and you like the way that their relationship is working. That might be something that you could identify as maybe I should seek their advice. I should get some input from them. If it's professional, whether that's, you know, you desire to be a commander and you have a really good commander, that might be another person. In some way, I think the starting point is you have to identify that delta, which gets back to Colin's statement earlier. You need to know what it is you're shooting for because otherwise it's like the Cheshire cat in Alice in Wonderland. It doesn't matter where you go if you don't know where you're trying to get to. So that first thing you have to do is identify someone that has something that you are looking to achieve. So let's start with that. Colin, any thoughts? Yeah, you're right on target there, Reed. That if you don't know what you're looking for, then you're never going to find the mentors who's going to help you to get there. But let's say that then you have found that. You do see someone who has achieved what you want. There might already be a relationship. There probably isn't a formalized mentorship relationship. But how do you then establish one? Well, you ask. That's step number one. You have to ask for the relationship to take place. It doesn't have to be a super formal type of thing where you say, hey, will you be my mentor? But no, you ask for their advice. You ask for an answer to a question that you have. You take responsibility as the mentee to develop that relationship. You bring them your questions with a possible solution and ask the mentor to provide some sort of feedback to you, some sort of advice or guidance on the situation that you're dealing with. But the important thing there is that you, the mentee, take ownership and responsibility for that relationship, because the benefit is primarily going to be for you. And the person that you're hoping to be your mentor, they're probably, well, one, they're successful, otherwise you wouldn't be approaching them. And because they're successful, they're probably busy because success tends to beget more success. And that kind of person is just going to be regularly involved in lots of different kinds of things to include mentorship. You're probably not the only one that they're mentoring. And so you need to be deliberate and purposeful in trying to establish that relationship on a semi-regular basis. Anything else to add on that, Reed? Yeah, just a couple quick add-ons. I like how you said it doesn't have to be like a super formal thing. Some of the best mentorship I've ever gotten started with quick conversations in the break room where, hey, you know, I'm wrapping up a lesson. Hey, we were talking about this lesson. And then I just asked a question. Hey, what do you think about X, Y, or Z? And I got some nice little nuggets of knowledge. And I'm like, oh, okay, this person does have a perspective that I could use. You know, I'd already kind of identified this person as someone who had something that I was interested in learning about. And you just kind of built on that success. I don't know that I've ever like reported to a senior officer and said, sir or ma'am, would you be my mentor? It's always been a small success built on some little nugget or something that I identify in that person. And so I like to think of mentorship more as like a, an attitude and a perspective than a canonized on a list, a spreadsheet. You know, I don't have a spreadsheet with the person I seek for Intel officer mentorship is in the list. It's certainly not that formal. But I don't Colin, believe you, Reed. You I know, are the I kind know. of person that would do that. Yes, I know. I knew you were <laughs> going to say that. But yeah, I just want to point out that when the question is, how do I find a mentor? Don't narrow your scope too much. Keep your eyes up, looking at the horizon. You may find mentors in surprising places. Yeah, and right. to pile on top of that, you may find that the best mentor for the thing that you are dealing with at the time is not someone of higher rank, is not someone who's older than you, has more gray hair than you, or something like that. You may find that the best mentor for the thing that you are dealing with is going to be a senior airman who has been in the Air Force just about as long as you have, but is coming at the issue 
from a very different perspective that you can't see. Because again, this is about filling your blind spots. This is about getting answers to questions that you don't have. So don't discount that mentorship can come from unexpected sources. The next question was one I really enjoyed sharing, and it's examples of people that have been good mentors to us. So hopefully we can give you some good examples here of how you and I have been mentored, Colin, and the impacts that had on our career and on our lives. There was an episode that we did earlier this year where I interviewed my former commander, Colonel Fred Thaden. He was my commander at Air Force ROTC. I count him as a mentor. And the interview that we were doing was about officer development. And in the course of the interview, I asked him the question about what an officer should do who doesn't necessarily want to pursue command. Because I found that that was actually a, a situation that I'm in that I don't know whether or not I want to be a squadron commander at some point in my future. And Colonel Thaden, he turned it into a mentorship moment. I was interviewing him, but right there, it flipped. And he started interviewing me. And like I was saying before, a good mentor is someone who provides you the opportunity to solve your own problem. So instead of just saying, these are the things that you need to have if you want to be a commander, and if you don't meet them, that you should not. But he started asking me the questions about, well, why do I feel that way? What would it take for me to feel comfortable with being a commander? And in that instance, even though it was me interviewing him, it became a mentorship moment for me, one that Reed called attention to as we talked about what happened in our commentary afterward. Reed, do you want to add any additional thoughts to that? Yeah, just how skilled he was at providing that feedback and being a mentor. And that brings up something that I think, Colin, you and I talk a lot about on our podcast. I want to bring out to everyone here. This is part of our job. We are leaders. And one of our important responsibilities is to make more leaders. So as you go through your mentorship journey as a mentee, also keep in mind that you need to be able to do this for others. And so it's helpful to wear both of those hats. How would I answer this question for someone else in the future? Boy, I sure learned something there. I better take note of that, that kind of idea. So because as I was watching Colonel Thaden just be the Jedi and mentor Colin in this interview, I realized that that wasn't the first time he had done that. He was certainly practiced. And so that is something that I recognize in that situation. And Colin, I'll take that as you know my cue to kind of talk about a mentor that I had that taught me something very important. So I was an executive officer for a group commander. And this colonel had to make a lot of hard decisions and often very unpopular ones. And that resulted in hurting people. And I found that he was very good at doing that without making it personal. He actually kind of dashed my hopes and dreams at the time. He didn't recommend me for a program that I was very interested in and didn't support my application. And, you know, I was personally devastated by that. Yet somehow, when he hired me to be his executive officer, I found that it wasn't personal at all. It was absolutely mission related. And so you know, sitting at the desk and watching him make these decisions that were impacting people's lives. They were unpopular. You know, command is very lonely. But watching him do it in a way that the people would leave the room and recognize that this was not a personal decision. This was not an attack against you as a person. That he was defending the mission was very insightful. And I think has definitely benefited me. You know, it's really hard when you are you have a close relationship with someone and you have to issue discipline. You know, they've let you down. They've screwed up. You can do that in a way that is not personal. And he showed me how to do that. And I don't think that's something that can come very easily to many people. And he showed me just a masterclass in doing that. And I've got many others, but that's one that really sticks out. Love those examples. Some great reminders, actually, from interviews that have happened you know, on this podcast. So that then leads into the next question, which is, what should you ask your mentor once you have one? I think we both have the same answer for this one. Feedback. Yep, absolutely. 
no holds barred, unabashed, bold face feedback. It should be an uncomfortable discussion. If it isn't, if they're pulling their punches, that's not okay. Again, what is the point of the relationship? Is to help you to address the gaps in your knowledge and experience. And that's uncomfortable to be told, this is where you're screwing up, or this is what you don't know, and this is how you're going to fix it. And if you don't have the mentor who is willing to give you that feedback, then there are ways to learn it. Like what Reed was saying earlier, through your own painful experience, you can gain that knowledge, but it's better if you can get it from somebody else, even if it's going to be a little uncomfortable. Yeah, totally agree. And that's without question feedback. And it has to be, again, they're not attacking you as a person. You can still leave difficult conversations as friends, as mentor, mentee. That's the way it should be. And when you get to that point where people are able to give you that really clear, uncomfortable feedback, that's the only place and only time and only setting where real growth can happen. And that's a pretty special thing. It's a pretty magical thing. I remember another session with someone that I also count as a mentor when they just basically looked at me and they're like, well, it's about time that you recognized you were struggling. You know, they had kind of let me struggle a little bit in order for me to get to that place where they could give me that feedback. I had to almost humble myself and recognize my weakness and failings. And then when I finally turned to them and like, I just can't figure this out. They're like, well, it's about time. You know, I've been standing here ready to help you, but you needed to get where you were ready to hear it. And I count that session as one of those, you know, really key turning points in my life. So Absolutely. They've got to be able to give you that no holds barred feedback that we all need if we're going to progress. And again, this goes into the importance of you bringing something to the relationship for them to provide feedback on, as opposed to just being a blank slate that they are then going to drop all of their knowledge onto because that's not feedback. That's really no different than just like reading a book, which reading a book is really important. You should read. But that's not mentorship. Without closing that feedback loop of you bringing your questions, bringing your possible solutions to the conversation and they being able to comment on it, that is then a mentor-mentee relationship. Awesome. The next thing that we're going to talk about kind of ties those last two questions together. And it's why is it important to be a part of a professional organization? And I think the tie in here with mentorship is pretty clear, but we'll turn it over to our response. I think it's essential that you have diversity of thought. And when you join an organization, a professional organization, when you're part of a group, it allows you to find solutions to problems that you aren't thinking about, that you would not have considered. I especially think they're very useful in solving problems that aren't new. Sometimes we get into our zone and we think that we are the first people who've ever needed to come up with, oh, I don't know, a 24-hour shift schedule. And guess what? Other people have had to do that before and they've had failures and successes. And it's a great way for you to find like-minded people and spread that knowledge so that it doesn't suffer in isolation. And so... You know, there are a number of groups that I'm in on Facebook, for example. It's the only reason I still stay on that social network because I'm able to reach out to my peers as intelligence officers and immediately get answers to things that we're struggling with in ways that I would not have come up with. Or, you know, say I'm at a large IC member organization, right? And I can get an answer from somebody who's doing small unit support and vice versa. And getting outside of, you know, my little silo has been exceptionally valuable. And I think that's one of the first things I think when I think of the value of being in a larger organization when it comes to, you know, getting solutions to problems. Yeah, everything that Reed said is exactly right. But I will say that type of interaction with a larger group of people in your profession, that's not mentorship. But there's no better place to find a professional mentor, I should say, than in one of those organizations. Because here you are surrounded by people who are involved in your craft, and some of them are going to be that more experienced, higher rank type of person that will likely have achieved the success that you are looking for. 
So if you then participate in that professional organization, their meetings, their conferences, that sort of thing, then you can start to build that relationship that can turn into a very valuable mentor mentee type of relationship. One of the questions that was brought up in at the end of the meeting here was beyond finding a mentor, what is something that I can do to develop myself professionally? Yes, I know I need a mentor, but what else can I be doing? And Reed, you and I, we jumped right on that one. So let's turn it over to our response there. Right off the bat, you need to read. Leaders are readers. You've probably heard that before. And we have made no small issue out of the importance of professional reading. In fact, we had an entire episode dedicated just to the idea of professional reading. What I want to emphasize is that it doesn't matter what you read so long as you are reading. Anything to add there, Reed? No, totally concur. That was the first thing I thought of at Matt's question is reading and how important that's been. I will add on that. I also think you need to find some way of also writing, whether that's in some sort of creation. And that's why, Colin, this has been such a valuable experience for me. When we write an episode, I get to spend a few hours thinking and writing. And that is so much different than just shouting at the sky and shaking my fist and being grumpy about something. I actually have to think of a solution. So that has been exceptionally valuable. And you see that in all sorts of ways. You see the Green Notebook or War on the Rocks. There's a bunch of other venues where other military thinkers are writing. And whether that's, you know, in podcast creation, doing a YouTube video, whatever, I think there's a lot of value in creating something. And whether that's hosting a session like this, I think, Matt, what you and your team are doing, this is professional development. And you're taking an active role in that. And that creation, not just absorbing, I love reading, you can't help it with a name like mine. But it's just something that's been super beneficial to go out and create something along my journey. Professional reading, professional writing, but the act of doing something with the knowledge that if you just retain the knowledge and don't act on it, then it's just going to be of no benefit to you or anybody else. And it can't possibly grow. But doing something deliberate with the knowledge is what's important. All right. Getting close to the end here, but a couple other points that I thought were really interesting that they brought up. I'm glad we were able to discuss them. The second to last one here, are there different levels of mentors and different points in your career that you should be seeking different kinds of mentors? And I thought this was a really good discussion. Without question, absolutely. And we didn't quite delve into this. I kind of highlighted a little bit. I have many, many mentors and they are for different things, but they also do evolve. I've recently pinned on 04, so a newly major, and I don't need someone to help me as a CGO as much as I need someone to help me enter those field grade officer years. So I'm now looking for different mentors with different experiences to help me manage that transition. So absolutely. And it's an evolving thing. And it kind of goes back to what we just said, Colin, it requires an active participation. There is no such thing as, well, I professionally developed myself. I sought good mentors as a second lieutenant. Therefore, I'm complete. Without question, it requires active management. I think that's a really good point you brought out in the question. So appreciate the question, sir. Yeah, my only add-on is you're never done. There's always more. And the mentors that you have got you to where you are, they might not get you to where you need to go next. So always be seeking out new mentors to help you with that continued growth and development across your career. Great points there. And then to wrap up the meeting, I asked a question of the audience. I didn't ask for a response, but I wanted everyone to think about why they are here today. What is it that you were looking for? Why did you attend? If yes, great. I'm glad you found it. Please go share it. If you didn't find what you were looking for, now you have homework to go take that next step and find a mentor who is going to help to address that issue for you. All right, Reed. So the audience now has had the chance to listen to our thoughts on mentorship. Some really great things that I think were brought out in the interview. 
that are going to be very useful to our audience. I know they'll be useful to me. I know that they'll be useful to you as well, Reed, especially as you move into your new role as a field grade officer, as a director of operations, moving more into that mentor role as opposed to the mentee role. Really great stuff that came out of this meeting. But there was something that I wanted to bring up that as I was listening to it again, it felt like all the conversations and the discussions that we were having about mentorship, that it was very much a one-sided relationship, that the mentor is giving of themselves to the mentee and they're receiving all of this great wisdom and experience and knowledge that they can use to go better themselves and help the Air Force improve. Or, you know, it doesn't have to be in the Air Force context, could be anywhere. But I had the thought, and I would love to talk to you about this, is the responsibility of the mentee to add value back to the mentor, to have it not be such a one-sided relationship. And I wanted to get your thought on that and have a little conversation about it. Yeah, it's interesting. As we did, you know, kind of our pregame before our recording, you said this is what you intended to talk about. And, and I've been kind of chewing on that. And I think the thing that first comes to mind is, Colin, in the same way that you and I started this podcast because we felt we had some info to share. We felt we had yeah. things to give to the audience that were of value that, you know, things we kind of wish we would have known when we were a young CGO or thinking to join the Air Force. And that sounds like the definition a little bit of a mentor's relationship with their mentee, right? I have something to give you. Right. Yet, we've continued to do the podcast, not because you and I still have info to share. We think we do, but it's changed for us. Yeah, We do this because we get something out of it. We learn the process of sitting down and crafting and thinking about the topics and interviewing other people. We are getting something out of it. And I wonder if that's a little bit what happens in a mentor-mentee relationship. Just by virtue of someone coming to you and asking a question, I think it could force you as a mentor to think more deeply about that topic, mm -hmm. to formulate a response. It's all fun and games to say, oh, when I'm in charge, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. When you're in charge, come find me and see if it's as easy as you think it is. <laughs> right? Just as an example, this week, 10 minutes before my very first staff meeting in the squadron, right? I've been there all of like five days. I'm still having a hard time understanding who's who in the zoo. Squadron commander calls up. He's like, hey, Emergencies come up. I need you to take staff meeting. Like, awesome, right? <laughs> Colin, how many times we've had a podcast session all about meetings, right? Right. Another toolbox. Another toolbox about how to run a meeting. You got to have an agenda. You've got, you know, all these things. I had 10 minutes. I couldn't run the meeting, quote, the way I always wanted to because I didn't get to. Yeah. Not my, you know, so what I'm getting at is I think there's a potential that the mentor can get something out of it by the very virtue that they've been asked a question that they then have to provide a response. I think that is a potential area that just asking can bring value to the mentor. Yeah. So my thought on this is very much like the teacher and student relationship that when someone teaches, when one teaches to learn, have you heard that before, right? Yeah. I actually wrote that down. Like you learn by teaching, you get more so yeah, we're kind of on the same page. So keep going. Yeah. So when you're forced to share your knowledge with somebody else, you have to come to grips with what you actually do or do not know. Mm -hmm. And that's a sometimes a really scary thing as a teacher to realize, hey, I don't actually know what I'm supposed to be teaching. But it's also a great way for you to reinforce the things that you do know. And another thought here is that when one shares to receive. Yeah. Does that make sense? Absolutely. That if you give of yourself, you are bound to receive something back. And so by virtue of the mentee approaching the mentor, you are providing them the opportunity to receive something back. Yeah. That they're going to, if nothing else, just improve in their own ability to be a mentor. Yeah. No. And it's funny. I actually think that this leads into the thing I wanted to talk about. And the question that I had as I, you know, listened to our responses and is the question that I asked myself, you know, I'm, I'm getting really good at these rhetorical questions. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just going to pose another one to the audience here. Why don't you have a mentor? That's a question I asked myself. Do I have mentors? 
Do I have enough? Are they in the areas that I'm weak? Why don't I have one? If there's an area of my life that I would like to improve, why don't I have a mentor in that thing? Mm -hmm. That's the question I want to pose the audience. And I think the connection with what you're discussing is, you know, your question about what does the mentor get out of it? What does the mentee get out of it? You know, is this a transactional relationship or, you know, how do we add value on both sides? Is what am I missing out on? What am I missing out on by not having a mentor? And what does it say about me and my attitudes if I don't have one? And I don't know that it's a good thing. If you could improve in some area, but you've chosen not to have a mentor, I think that shows maybe even a little arrogance. Yeah, it's really interesting. Now, I'll throw that out. That's a little strong, but I think it's something to think about. These are the thoughts I had as I listened to this session. I'm noodling on what you just said about why have I not chosen to have a mentor? That it's a choice. Yeah. That it's not something that's just going to happen out of the blue on accident, but that you choose to have a mentor. You may not necessarily choose the mentor, but you choose to have a mentor. Yeah. Yeah. It's your responsibility. Yeah. That was what I was thinking about at the end of it is that self-reflection, that introspection, like, well, how am I doing on this? And it's definitely given me something to think about. Yeah. So that's kind of where we want to leave it with you all is something to think about. This is a toolbox. Yes, hopefully you've gotten some, you know, some arrows you can add to your quiver. You know, hopefully you can use these things to think about how you're providing assistance to others and areas that you can improve in and how you can do that. But we'll just leave you with that question. Why don't you have a mentor? If you don't have one in certain areas, why not? And what does that say about you? Yeah. Hard hitting. Nice job, Reed. All right. Yeah. <laughs> just bring it on down. Good job. <laughs> I mean, maybe just to soften it a little bit. I like how you laid that out. But just to soften it a little bit to end maybe on a little bit higher note. I'm going to ask the same question that I asked at the end of the meeting with Sammy. Why did you come here today? Why are you listening to this episode today? Why are you tuning in to a Toolbox episode about mentorship? And did you find what you were looking for? If you did, great. Go share it. Go be a mentor. If you didn't, why not? Why didn't you find it? And, you know, provide some mentorship back to us. Provide some feedback. What didn't you find that you needed that will help you to be a better Air Force officer or to prepare you to become one? No, that's good. Great question, Colin. And I think that will do it for this week. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.